Welcome, everybody. Um, it's another Friday. Um, this is Music Cities Together Live. Uh, this is Michael Bracey joining you from outside of Washington, D.C. As always, we are absolutely thrilled that you are spending some of your Friday with us for an hour-long conversation about music and community and policy and infrastructure and activism and uh, philanthropy and all the different sort of uh, complicated things that we have been talking about in this most complicated of years, uh, 2020. Uh, today we're doing a couple things, which I'm, I'm really excited about. We're going to kind of toggle between uh, some conversations about um, things that are happening right this minute, um, literally kind of breaking in real time in, in terms of developments uh, here in Washington and with the live music community. Uh, and then we're going to take a little bit more of a little detour and we're going to talk big picture uh, about some structural issues um, related to uh, media ownership and, and some of the questions that we as a community are, are, have been tackling for a long time and, and we'll be tackling uh, in the years to come. So uh, buckle up, it's gonna be a lot of fun. As always, if you have questions, uh, please you can throw them into the Q&A. Our producer, uh, Alex Dolvin uh, is back this week. Thank you, Alex. And he'll be putting relevant links and other information into the chat uh, so you can follow along with some URLs as we talk to our different guests around different issues. Um, and as always, again, if you have questions, concerns, ideas, um, constructive criticism. Uh, we particularly enjoy the encouragement. Uh, you can always email us at musicpolicyforum at gmail.com. So, um, so we be begin uh, this week the way we begin every week, which is just a, a kind of a quick check-in on the insanity of what's happening with our political process and, and the impact that that has um, on our music communities and our music ecosystems. Uh, of course, you know, the show, um, you know, sort of by definition focuses on um, or cer certainly looming large over this program is the, you know, is the shutdown of live music, the arc of the pandemic. Uh, for those of you who are following, which I would assume would be everybody who watches the show, um, it's getting scary again. We had the, some of the highest uh, case numbers uh, nationwide that we've had uh, since June, I reported yesterday uh, here in the Washington area. We had a super spreader event last week and Things are getting dicey in the greater metropolitan area uh, as well. And um, that, you know, sort of, uh, uh, you know, makes us, uh, you know, heed the warnings from the public health officials and Dr. Fauci and others that, that fall and winter are going to be brutal. And it also makes us uh, look that much more uh, forward towards a time when we can reopen and we can get back to some sense of, of normalcy. Uh, in our lives and, and certainly in the music community uh, at some point in the future, hopefully uh, as soon as, as next May, if you listen to uh, the New York Times daily, daily podcast, uh, talked, had a good discussion about that earlier this week. Um, looming incredibly large uh, for the music community, of course, uh, is, um, you know, the, the, the whole question around, uh, are we going to get relief legislation? Um, are we going to see Congress pass a stimulus bill. And, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a moving target. Um, the House of Representatives has passed uh, two additional pieces of stimulus legis legislation uh, in the time since the CARES Act was signed. Um, those, uh, both those pieces of legislation were not really intended to pass. I mean, the, the, there was never an intent that the Senate was gonna take those up. Um, so they didn't, um, and uh, the uh, president has been a moving target this week, I, th I think it's safe to say, in terms of his willingness or his interest in supporting further stimulus uh, before the election. Uh, so again, as, as most of you know, he uh, used Twitter to uh, put a halt to negotiations. He has backtracked. He has said we should have a targeted bill. We should have a larger bill. Um, an hour ago, uh, apparently in Rush Limbaugh's radio program, he said we actually should have a larger stimulus bill than the one that was recently put forward by uh, Speaker Pelosi and the Democrats in, in the House of Representatives. So it, it feels like, again, there's increased momentum uh, to try to find accommodation on a stimulus package before the election uh, that would hypothetically uh, be up around $1.6 to $1.8 trillion feels like the number that they are um, kind of settling in on. 
uh, save our stages would be included in that legislation. Again, potentially as much as $10 billion to help support the live music uh, ecology. The question, of course, is going to be uh, how quickly can they reach a deal if they do reach a deal, and then what happens in the Senate? And, and the challenge, again, in the Senate is that the Senate Republicans are not inclined to be supportive of these type of policies. They don't really want to see money going out to support state and local budgets. Um, they perceive that this would be money really targeted for blue states. Um, and so on, on, on the one level, and then they also, of course, are, are, are trying to push through a Supreme Court nomination uh, as quickly as can before the election. So on one level, it feels um, like it would be a high bar to cross for uh, the Senate to take this up and to push it through. Uh, the flip side of that is there are a remarkable number of vulnerable Republican incumbent senators who are in incredibly difficult re-election campaigns and they all need to show some victories. And if you, we really do have a dynamic where the president and Nancy Pelosi and a bipartisan, uh, strong bipartisan vote in the House of Representatives has sent something over to the Senate, um, it's really hard to predict what would happen there, but that would be a pretty hard thing for them to reject. So what we're looking at, you know, big picture, which I know is not really uh, helpful for those of us who can't think big picture and need relief immediately. Um, big picture is that there have been amazing successes uh, driven uh, to large part by our friends, the National Independent Venue Association. And, and we're gonna be talking uh, about some other things that Neva is involved in in a minute. Um, there's been remarkable success in crafting this legislation of getting included in the House of, of Representatives bill of, of gaining bipartisan Senate support um, signals are the White House support, Save Our Stages being included in, in a stimulus bill if it comes through. Um, it may, again, get done before the election. Uh, if it does not get done before the election, depending on the results of the election, it could happen in a lame duck session, which could happen in November or early December, potentially tied in with con uh, continuing resolutions to keep government moving. Uh, or it may just be in the next uh, next Congress. And again, nobody knows things are very fluid in politics and certainly things are very fluid uh, in this election cycle. But, you know, if you read the analysis and, and look at the polls and, and listen to people who uh, are not partisan, but are just, you know, sort of analyzing, uh, anticipating what may happen in this election, it feels somewhere between likely and possible that the Democrats are going to control the White House, the House of Representatives and the Senate. If that is the case, there's 100 percent certainty there'll be a massive, massive um, stimulus package coming out of that Congress in the first quarter of, of 2021, which if uh, Save Our Stages has not been funded by that point would be, again, another vehicle. So there's been a lot of really hard work, a lot of really great progress, um, a lot of uncertainty, um, and we're just going to have to keep our eyes on Twitter, keep our eyes um, on our congressional champions and, and just see where we go. So with that, thank you for attending Michael Bracey's Story Hour. Um, we're going to shift now to some other developments uh, that have been spearheaded by our friends and colleagues uh, um, involved with the National Independent Venue Association. And I'm going to bring in from, from City of Denver, Lisa Gadegas. Lisa, thanks for, for joining us today. There you are. Hi, thank so, you. You've been um, deeply involved in the relief fund efforts, which I think has been really important because, again, I, I think the congressional cluster that we've all been watching is, is a, good, uh, a good example of why we can't sit back and hope that, that Congress is going to uh, be able to take care of some of the problems they need to take care of. Um, you've got some updates on what's happening with the relief fund, and, and you know, why don't we just start, if you don't mind, kind of big picture for those of us uh, who are watching the show today and have not been tracking this closely, could you give it a little bit of an of a overview of what the Relief Fund is and, and kind of what the intent is behind it? Yeah, and you know, I might tap in Chris right now to kind of give the even higher arch of NEVA of a bit for context. Um, he's our Colorado chapter leader. Um, so Chris, maybe, maybe you can talk about the membership of NEVA and how that kind of breaks down and then we can dive into the fund a bit. Yeah, so um, NEVA is an organization. We're the National Independent Venue Association. We represent over 3,000 independent venues and promoters across the United States. Um, this was uh, a group that didn't exist uh, until COVID hit. Um, and it's been remarkable to see all of these individuals come together to uh, work to lobby 
for support for the live music industry outside of, of what AEG and Live Nation do. Um, through the course of our work, we realized that uh, we needed to be working to put together some kind of a relief fund, but we didn't have any money. So <laughs> it's hard to do a relief fund without the money, chicken before the egg. Um, so Lisa and myself and David Weingarten, who's also on this call, um, worked on the original e uh, ERF committee to kind of explore what would this look like and how could we support venues. Um, it, we spent about two months putting, putting together a, a relief package for venues and that process just opened up. Um, it's not going to save venues and, and I want to be cautious with that. Um, Neva doesn't have uh, the resources available even through fundraising to, to save 3000 venues who are bleeding $45,000 a month each. Um, but uh, the ERF fund will work as a stopgap for the most vulnerable venues so that we don't lose them out of our ecosystem. Yeah. Yes. So, um, so we, oh, we figured out how to, you know, fly the plane and build it at the same time, which is what we're doing. It was important for us to open up this fund um, we even grappled with it a bit because we didn't want to get in the way of the Save Our Stages Act and show Congress or anyone else that we would also have this fund. And, you know, we didn't want to confuse messages, but it was so important to get it open. Um, it's open through October uh, 15th, um, and it's for venues and promoters to apply. There's two different applications for that. Um, like Chris said, we're looking at folks that are most at risk. We ask about 30 questions in the application that become a beautiful rubric to help us understand sort of level of severity um, with our spaces across the country. The good news too with that, building that infrastructure is that we can also then report out on what these venues are saying based on their answers anonymously and share with the nation what people are saying and, and how severe it actually is um, to raise more money and advocate. So. Um, <clears throat> it's all part of the same piece, but um, yeah, it's, it's a Band-Aid. Um, I don't like to use that term, but it's very realistic. This is phase one is what we're calling it. Um, so being that it's open only until the 15th, we will review um, all the applications that come in. We have a review panel that we are building from across the nation, um, and, and all of which is done through a lens of diversity, equity, and inclusiveness. Um, but, you know, again, save our stages. We all hope that goes through. And the fact that it is where it is right now is a, we got a long way. And music has never had this kind of support across the nation in its history. Um, and so it's, we all feel very privileged to be a part of Neva and the building of that history. Um, you know, if anything happens in the future, we can be there for that. Um, and this group can be there for that, whatever trauma that might be once we get past this. Um, what else can I say about it? What kind of questions do you think I can answer, Michael? Well, I think that's, you know, I think that's a good overview. I mean, I, I, you know, I think part of what is obviously incredibly tricky about this or complicated about this moment is the uncertainty around the federal funding. And, you know, on the one hand, you've got you know, fundraising efforts over on, on one side, there are a lot of local fundraising efforts going on in terms of, of trying to get city and county, um, you know, funds, you know, and, and that's happening all across the country, which has been helpful. And then you've got this potential $10 billion, which may or may not be allocated if and when, you know, Congress finally moves. And, and so I know that it's just complicated to follow all the different, you know, kind of pops of money. Um, you know, we do have a, a good question actually coming in from Danny Grant, just, you know, Wondering, um, you know, sort of building off of, of, I love this, you know, sort of, you know, sort of language used, Lisa, about, you know, building the plane and, and flying at the same time. And that's what we're all doing, right? 2020, everybody's just like trying to just, you know, make stuff up as we go along and, and try to respond to the crisis. And, you know, Danny's kind of wondering if the sort of infrastructure that's being built here is potentially going to be uh, a vehicle that can be used for distribution of other funds in the future, you know, particularly ideally when we're not in complete crisis mode, um, which is interesting. And I would suggest maybe that's a rhetorical question more than a, something you would have an answer to, but I don't know, Chris or, or Lisa or David Weingarten, you're also welcome to join in if, if you have any thoughts on, on sort of the future of these types of 
philanthropic efforts over time. Yeah, I can I can take an answer on that, Danny. How are you doing today? Um, absolutely. I mean, I think that the the long term goal of Neva at this point in time is to continue to to raise money and build this fund and do a few tranches to get people to SOS or, or to a vaccine, and then after that looking at it as, as a catalyst to help venues that are in areas that suffer either economic or, or physical disaster from, you know, New Orleans is a perfect example. Every time there's a hurricane, the city floods and these venues are, are, you know, quickly running out of, of capital to be able to, to, to repair these, to keep repairing their venues year after year. So if we can continue to do that long term, um, it, I, I think it's really going to help our industry to have this this one kind of fund that we can tap from time to time. Yeah, no, that that's awesome, and and we've got some really good questions coming in. I want to we're going to pause the questions for two seconds because um, David and Chris uh, and Melissa as well, but Neva and everybody you know has has made some pretty exciting news this week with a a way to really bring forward again the Save, Save Our Stages campaign. Um, in, in a way that I, I think is both going to generate a lot of money, but also, again, increased awareness and engagement around these issues. And Alex, if you, if you don't mind, if you could just run the video real quick, let's, let's show the trailer for the sta Save Our Stages um, announcement this week. That's fun. That's good. So congratulations. Um, that's awfully exciting. Um, why don't you talk a little bit about what we should expect with the festival and kind of thinking behind it and, and how uh, people are participating in, in, in this uh, session can help amplify that, you know, with their own networks and things like that. I don't know, David or Chris, you want to jump in? Yeah, I can jump in. Um, it's going to be, uh, you know, going off of what Lisa and Chris had said about the emergency relief fund, this is going to be our way to fund it. And it's going to be, um, we, we, the expectation is we're going to be raising millions and millions of dollars for it. Um, to what extent we're not exactly sure, but the amount of push that uh, we're receiving or the, the, the backing that we're receiving, I should say from YouTube and from Google um, is tremendous. Um, all the way from the, all the way to the top. I mean, we're going to be on the YouTube masthead, YouTube music masthead um, for the weekend, which is massive. Um, the amount of eyeballs that's on there. There's also, we're also going to be on the Google homepage, which has rarely, if ever happened, I think it's only happened a handful of time and they're getting like 50 billion eyeballs a day on that. So the amount of, um, you know, extrapolating from there could be just massive. And on top of that, we'll have 3000 venues all pushing it to all of their exponential patrons and fans on all the different, um, you know, platforms as well, uh, social media platforms, plus the artists that um, the amazing artists, everybody from the Lumineers to Miley Cyrus to Food Fighters to Brittany Howard and whatnot, who are going to be pushing this out as well. So it's going to be, it could be one of the biggest, um, online events that we've ever seen. And um, I don't, I'm not saying that in a very hyperbolic way either. Like I really believe that could happen. Um, and if you look at what happened with um, when, when Prince, um, when they just did the reissue of that show from 1985 and there was um, a Music Cares um, package that they uh, had everybody donate to. I think they raised upwards of five to $10 million just on the one day <clears throat> that they had it out there, excuse me. So 
this is going to be exponential to that. And um, we're just really excited that um, it can all take place. And uh, I am particularly honored that the Boulder Theater is going to be the, the Colorado venue for that, um, for, for um, this festival. Um, there's going to be 25 different venues throughout the United States. Um, everything from the 930 Club in DC to the Troubadour in Los Angeles, um, to the Belly Up in Solano Beach, um, and of course the Boulder Theater. That's awesome. So obviously congratulations, and, and I know um, the artists involved are, are, are thrilled, right? I mean, you know, that's been one of the one of the nice things about this year is just to see the, you know, the, the, you know, the depth and the quality of, of artists who, you know, recognize, you know, that they get to where they got in their careers because they had that letter of venues. They had the independent venues that give them the opportunity to find their audience and to commit to their craft. And, you know, as somebody who's done this work for longer than I'd like to admit, it's, it's really, really heartening, you know, not only, you know, to see the emergency response and to see how everybody's scrambling in 2020, but also to think about the long-term infrastructure that's being built here. And right. we look at, at what Mark David and, and Beverly and, and, and their team have done with Music Venue Trust in terms of raising awareness and understanding of the latter of venues and the importance of grassroots music venues. And we see what, you know, Tim and Katie Tutton and their, their crew have done in Chicago, with Chicago Independent Venue League, and, and kind of building that infrastructure. And we're seeing this, you know, at, at the national level with, with Neva. We're seeing at the local level in terms of all the organizing Colorado and King County, Washington. An amazing announcement this week out of Louisville, Kentucky. Venues coming together, Charlotte. We're really building this infrastructure, which is going to lead to something, right? And and I know it's hard, you know, I'm saying this to myself, not to you, you know, but it, it, we always have to remind ourselves that 2020 will end, you know, at some point there will be a future. It's going to be different, um, but it's, it's going to be, you know, it's not going to be what, it, what you know, life is not going to go back to what it quote unquote used to be, you know, a year ago, but it's, it, it, but we're going to be able to do things differently and to have the sort of uh, public awareness and engagement around the importance of venues, to have the artist commitment there, to have the policymakers thinking about this in a way they never have before, right? Policymakers at the, certainly at the national level have not engaged in this conversation about sustaining our, our local music um, infrastructure at all, um, or, or, or very rarely. So, it gives me a lot of hope and optimism about where we're going with this. Um, a couple of really great questions have come in. Um, ben London is asking about um, the announcement yesterday from AG Live Nation about the work that that they're doing. Um, you know, David, you said you had a sense of that they're doing something a little bit kind of complementary to what you're doing, but sort of parallel. Could you either Chris or David speak to? Yeah, it, it all it all helps. Um, yeah. All of these organizations. Um, the, the, the NEVA, which is the National Independent Venue Alliance, NEDO, which is the National Independent Talent Organizers, um, which is like agents and managers and whatnot, they're, they've come together um, and they're, 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 on, they're partnering with us and on the same page. And then with this AAG and Live Nation um, initiative, which also encompasses some of the um, larger agencies like William Morris and CAA, um, you know, they're, they're looking at it with... Um, the, from the aspect of the of, of the workers and everybody that are unemployed, and so all of it together um, just goes back to like the, supporting the, the the ecosystem, which is massive. You know, like if you think about, it's not just about the venues; it's about the workers. It's about you know the the the, per, the the person that we bring in who sells the merchandise, you know, for the bands every night, the caterers who come in on a daily basis, the the bus drivers, the um, the truck drivers, the the riggers, like I, I mean, it's it, it's just in across the country, it's in the millions, and the amount of people that are out of work within this um, ecosystem is massive. And um, you know what Chris continues to always point out in some of these interviews, um, which is a really big um, thing, is that for every dollar that's spent on a concert ticket, um, twelve dollars goes back into the community um, around those shows. So you think about all the different restaurants or the taxi drivers, the Lyft drivers, the, you know, um, the, the, the bars that are next to us. Um, so it's just an important, and on top of it all, the people want, people want in their communities, they want art and music and culture. It's extremely important and it makes um, a, a community, people want to live in these, in these places with these venues. And, um, and it brings, it, it's a community gathering place. It's a third place, you know, sometimes between, besides the home and the office. 
So it's a very important aspect to our culture and we need to, we need to preserve these to the best of our ability. Yeah. That's very well put. And, and I, I very much appreciate, you know, this notion that, you know, all hands on deck and, you know, hopefully we don't have a lot of competing infrastructure or campaigns, but there's enough room for a lot of voices and a lot of organizing. And certainly on, on, on this program, we've really tried to highlight a lot of those, you know, throughout the last couple of months of just people who are, are just saying, here's a need, let's just do what we can do. You know, let's just see where, where we can engage. Um, a really good question in, in the Q&A um, just around, you know, right now, again, we're, we're focusing efforts around kind of venue infrastructure and, and organizing you know, where are their parallel efforts around musicians? Um, and I would suggest that that's a challenge, you know, and, and, and I think one of, the, one of the hardest parts about 2020 from my standpoint, you know, is the notion that, um, you know, I don't want to be uncharitable in saying this, but, but, but there's a little bit of a sense that the ability for working musicians to be able to file for unemployment was sort of, that was um, victory. And yes, I mean, that was critically important, right? I mean, it's an unbelievably important for freelance workers and musicians to be able to apply for unemployment and receive those benefits. And, and we all know musicians would have just been even more devastated without access to those resources, but we have to do better than that. Like that is not just success. And We've been highlighting on this program um, conversations around creative workforce initiatives, around other sort of ways of, of, again, reflecting on the fact that, you know, everybody who participates in our Friday program, all of the guests, we're all doing this work because the music community was not really functioning to begin with, right? I mean, we've all been working to say, how can we improve this, these ecosystems? How can we strengthen this, these structures? How can policymakers, you know, play a better role or, or a more engaged role in terms of, of what we need to really maximize uh, and, 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 and sort of lift up the role of music in, in our communities. Um, and so there's a lot of work to be done there. And what I would suggest is, again, and I've said this publicly, I probably said it four times today in the show already, you know, I think the work that's been spearheaded by Neva, you know, is by far and away the greatest example and the most effective, you know, advocacy public engagement campaign um, you know, around music that I've seen in 22 years of doing this work, right? I mean, like this has been something that um, you know, hopefully one of our takeaways from this is, of course, it takes a crisis to you know, be the catalyst. And that's just the way things work sometimes. But hopefully we can be able to take this and build momentum and build power moving forward for all the other issues that are um, that need to be looked at and addressed as we kind of evolve in our music systems. Um, so hopefully, again, uh, when we get to whatever the next stage of our lives are going to look like in the next stage of our music scenes, uh, we're not sort of declaring victory and washing our hands of this and saying, well, that was something we're done. It's like, no, how do we feel inspired by this experience to, to go do more, you know, and, and figure out what that is. And certainly from our standpoint, Music Policy Forum, and I'm sure from everybody who's participating in the show, putting musicians in the front of that conversation is, is central. You know, this is all about musicians. Um, so, well, you guys have been great. I really appreciate you, you coming in. Um, again, we've got a bunch of the links uh, in, in the chat. Um, and I know people can figure out uh, enterprise and ways of tracking you down if they have other specific questions um, or want to know how they can support this. But I'm excited for the festival. Uh, I am so done with Zoom and I'm so done with Zoom festivals, but I'm going to make an exception for, for the SOS Fest because it looks great. Um, 930 Club has been a very important part of my life, my family's life. And it's going to be great to see, you know, you just feel like I'm back in that space. I know that's what a lot of music fans feel like um, all across the country. So so thank you guys, much appreciated. Um, and you. now we're gonna, we're gonna do the big old pivot and uh, we're gonna go from 2020 venue challenges and, and welcome Joe and Alicia. Um, and we're gonna be talking about structural media reform, um, which I'm so happy to have both of you all uh, on with us today because I, I think you know, when we talk about the structures of the music community, we talk about the importance and the requirement of our community to not be passive and to be active and engaged and think about what do we have control over and what are the, the, the sort of things that we can do, again, not just in a moment of crisis and not about relief, but about envisioning and reimagining what music can look like, and what these structures look like. It's about media and it's always been about media. And you know, not to be the old man in the Friday afternoon Zoom, but 
you know, many of the uh, many folks in our audience did not live through the 1996 Telecommunications Act. They did not live in a world where commercial radio was locally based and was competitive and was robust and was really central to our culture. And, you know, those lessons, again, that we've all had to learn in the music community the hard way about what happens when you lose that sort of competition and, and diversity uh, and you get into these other structures, that's a problem. So you guys are doing some interesting things. I'm going to start easy peasy, and I'd love for you to just introduce yourselves and talk a tiny bit about what you do at Free Press and what Free Press's mission is, and then we're going to shift into what we're really here to talk about today. Alicia, do you want to start and say hi? Sure. Um, thanks so much, Michael, for having us on here. Um, this is a really exciting and great space to be talking about this work. Um, my name is Alicia Bell. I, I work at Free Press, which is a, a national um, media and technology advocacy organization. And so um, we've been working for the, over the past 15, 16 years on um, various media and tech policy issues, as well as doing um, field and community organizing to support um, how we create it, local media infrastructures and ecosystems that really, really meet the needs of, of folks in a variety of local communities. Um, so I'm excited to be here as a part of the Media 2070 team, um, which is our, our project thinking about what are the, the media ecosystems that we need at a national and regional and local level in 2070? And then how do we start practicing those things now um, so that we're steeped in that culture by the time 2070 gets here? Awesome. We're so happy you're here. And, and Joe, would you talk a little bit about kind of your portfolio at Free Press and what brings you to this work today? Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. My name is Joseph Torres. I've been working at Free Press since 2007. Um, yeah, so, you know, group. I've worked on a whole bunch of issues through the years. Uh, the first issue I started to work on when I joined Free Press was low power FM radio. You know, uh, that was the first one, and it was an actual successful campaign. Worked with Hannah Sassman for the Prometheus Radio Project, and you know, and, uh, and so that was a um, so so it's own, clearly an you know, ownership issue, right? And um, local ownership, and then work on media ownership issues and net neutrality. Uh, working to build coalitions of racial justice groups to uh, to have support in D.C. for the not only to build support uh, nationally, to bring greater, greater awareness to issues like net neutrality, um, but also to um, uh, to make sure folks in D.C. know that uh, people of color uh, across the country care about these issues and care about policy issues. And, and now I'm part of the Media 2070 team where we're trying to. Uh, uh, you know, it, we're trying, we're try, we want to we wanna re release an essay, we have a coalition where uh, we want to build a coalition to talk about what does media reparations look like for the Black community uh, to address the long history of harm uh, that the media system and media companies have done from colonial times uh, to the present day. So that's what, and, 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 uh, and I'll talk more about it, but I'll stop right there. I'll stop there. No, that's, that's great. And, and, and so, you know, part of the complexity of, of, of 2020, I think certainly in, in our community, in the music side has been, um, you know, the pause has created space for a reflection and for some real deep thinking and some real internal thinking. And, and one of the things that's been fascinating to watch uh, in, 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 you know, so we have this uh, this REVS initiative, which is the Reopen Every Venue Safely initiative with 11 pilot cities, where basically on an organic level, our, our pilot cities are, are convening on a weekly basis or by a weekly basis, music stakeholders from across the city to, you know, explore issues about reopening and, and things like that. And, and, and most of our pilots, in a very organic way, that has led to, again, really fascinating conversations about how do we reimagine what our music ecosystems or music communities look like and what they should look like. And, and how do we articulate the flawed structures that have been barriers and, and, and challenges in many of our local music scenes? And then how do we flip that into, um, you know, into meaningful, actionable strategies and initiatives? And, and, and just one example on that uh, is, is we were really excited uh, over the summer to, you know, to, to bring Josh Kuhn in from, from USC um, and talk about one of Josh's initiatives, which is called Big Payback, which is basically digital reparations, you know, which is basically recognizing the power structures in, and particularly in the major label side of, of the music industry and how they've been just deeply exploitative of, 
you know, essentially artists of color and, and, and made a lot of money off of exploiting back catalog in ways that the, those, 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 uh, you know, those, those license fees and, and other fees are just not getting to the artists. So, you know, that's an initiative that, that Josh is cooking up, you know, over out at, out at USC. But so I was just completely fascinated when I, I saw your release around media 2070 and media reparations. And I think these things completely align and completely connect. I'd love for you to just walk us through a little bit about, you know, both the big picture about what is the vision behind this and, 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 you know, why don't we just start there? What, what is the vision behind this and, and kind of where are you at this stage? Yeah. Um, so we we started this this project just thinking about um, one of the things that we had been doing in our, our kind of community organizing at a at a city level and a, a very hyper local level um, was talking to folks about media ecosystems and media infrastructures there. Um, and one of the things that we heard across the board being in, especially when we were in black communities and black and brown communities, is that there, there was an absence of trust, at least. Um, and in some cases, there, was, there had been harm that had happened or harmful relational history. Um, and, and so out of that and interrogating that, what we really understood is that that was a symptom and it, it wasn't the core cause. Um, and so as we started kind of excavating and unearthing and exploring the core cause of that, that took us all the way back um, to the 1700s and 1800s and um, the release of newspapers and news organizations and media organizations and the ways that they, um, they, they really created foundations for exploiting and, and facilitating exploitation amongst people um, during chattel slavery. And so from there, we started writing. Um, and, and at first, I think someone proposed that we write like a 750 word op-ed about this. <laughs> um, and so, <laughs> uh, I think about that a lot these days because we just released the 27,000 word <laughs> Um, and uh, what we what we figured out is that it was a little bit longer than 750 words to figure out how to bring us from se the 1700s to 2020, um, and, and all the different examples of of divisiveness, of anti-blackness, of um, media infrastructure being used to shift public opinion and and harm communities and and kind of co-conspire with. Um, harmful poli media policies that were happening. Um, and so our, our vision is that this essay is just kind of the starting of, of really expanding the record. A lot of the history that we cover in the essay is not th are not things that people learn in schools and journalism schools and mass communications programs, any of those things. It's not common local history. Um, and so we really wanted it to be a space to create alignment around some of that unearthing. Um, and there were a lot of stories that we even learned kind of in the process that, that we, ha we didn't know about. Um, and, and so from there, we are, we are building a consortium of folks because this, when we think about kind of one of the bedstones of, of media, um, we, we, were thinking about, we were thinking about journalism and what is the role of journalism in this space? Um, but the more and more we wrote it, the more we were like, this is actually, this is, uh, this is the whole media issue. Um, it's not just journalism. It is, it is information media. It is news media. It is storytelling media. Um, and it, it really comes down to what is, how are black folks able to hold and steward our stories and our, our communities um, stories from ideation to distribution. That's really the question. Um, and that is a question that impacts all different kinds of sectors and industries within media. Um, so we're building out this consortium to try to bring people together and then figure out how we build a media reparations platform and then utilize that as a pathway to, to getting to whatever our dreamiest visions are for 2070 um, and our dreamiest visions for, for media, new media ecosystems. Because we know that what we have right now is not working. It is chaotic. It, it breaks easily. Um, and it's not sustainable. Well, and, you know, I think, you know, part of what, I, again, I, I think is, is um, you know, sort of the, just the evolution of the term reparations, you know, it's been so fascinating to watch in the last, you know, seven or eight years. And, 
And part of what I, really inspires me about the essay, and, and, and Alex put the, the links to the essay in, in, in the chat, and I totally recommend it. It's, um, it is a long read, but <laughs> it's, it's well, well researched. Now, there's a lot there. And I just really, you know, again, as someone who's been fortunate to do kind of media policy and activism for a couple of decades, it, it just is really enlightening and helpful, you know, to be able to take this arc and to see the through line and to say that this is not new, right? I mean, this is just kind of like how we've, I mean, not, you know, elements of this have been sort of baked into the pie from the beginning. And, you know, part of what I really admire about free press and, and, and partner organizations is then the ability to say, okay, we can be talking at a sort of an ideological or conceptual level, but now we can think about what does that actually mean in practice? And, and I know that, you know, by building the consortia, you're not being prescriptive right now and saying, okay, we've figured out the agenda. We know exactly what, you know, what it is. So I, I, I don't want you to kind of prejudge the process, but I do think that you can sort of intellectually think about how do you draw linkages to what reparations could look like in terms of policy, you know, and, and maybe Joe, you could speak a little bit about like some of the things that, you know, are either, I mean, this year's a mess for a lot of reasons. So I don't know if we need to talk about 2020 communications policy, but certainly things over the your time, or the time we've collaborated, you know, on some of these issues, what are some of those big ticket issues that tie in directly to these questions that Alicia was, was, was talking about in terms of, you know, access and control? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, as, as you, you know, a couple of things, it's like, um, you know, people of color have been fighting black folks in, 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 you know, have been fighting for, uh, a dem to democratize the media system for as long as the media system existed, you know, and, the idea of like we talk about it just real quick um we start from colonial times where we find the first newspapers were also the print you know and the, the printers the, the newspapers and their printers were um you know uh were involved in the slave trading human trafficking you know they were uh uh, uh folks who sold uh slave ads for, to, for the sale of slaves often the publisher who is also the printer acted as the broker between the buyer and the seller and so there's evidence that Benjamin Franklin was one of those folks, right? So the idea that you talk about in colonial times and how this was the sale of slave ads was critical to making the paper financially viable at this time, right? And we're talking about like we're talking about now with uh, with, uh, with uh, Governor Whitner with uh, with uh, with uh, militia. You know, there was there was a coup in this country in 1898 in Wilmington, North Carolina, and one of the chief the, the um, the campaign leaders was Joseph S. Daniels, the editor of the, uh, and publisher of the Raleigh News and Observer, right? And now we have like Fox News and we have Facebook, you know? And we have a president calling for white militia who was a media creation. You know, he's, in, you know, so like history continues to evolve and yet we have media policies that continue to give uh, broadcast stations uh, throughout its history to known racists and segregationists that we outline in, in, in the book or we have them media companies who think like Donald Trump may be bad for America, but great for CBS, right? <laughs> and they get all those stations, right? And so it's like, we have a de facto media apartheid system, you know? And where uh, today, as of 2017, uh, black people only own 12%, uh, only own 12 full power television stations in this country, less than 1%. And yet we, 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 we live in a, a, a where we, we live in a country where uh, a multiracial democracy has not been fully realized. So if we're going to, um, if we're going to truly live in, and this is what the game is about right now, you know? <laughs> and so it's like, so if we, if media has played a central role in the narratives that they put out in order to maintain a white racial hierarchy. And so if we think about media policy, in some ways it's very simple, right? In some ways it's like, what is the outcome we should see? Well, we should see a, a, a we should democratize the media system where, as Alicia said, uh, black folks have the ability to control it and distribute, create and control the, uh, the creation of their own narratives and, and distribution of their own narratives, to be able to control the distribution and the platforms that they're on, right? And so what does that mean? What, is, what does it mean to have a, 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 a democratized social media platform, right? What does it mean? What, what does it mean for broadcast stations that have consolidated Right, we, right now, uh, the cases that we've been fighting for years uh, against the FCC further deregulating the broadcast industry, 
because they have failed to address issue of minority and female ownership, right, that we've been winning in court. The court can tell the FCC, you cannot further deregulate uh, broadcast, local broadcast stations in the, in the broadcast market because you have failed to study what is the impact on women and people of color. And free press have actually argued on court, and the court continues in Philadelphia, Third Circuit, say, FCC, if you fail to do this, they don't want to do it. They're taking it to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court, uh, a few, a few, uh, just a few days ago, really, a, few, a couple of weeks ago, decided to hear that case. That puts the future of, like, what is the FCC's ability, like, it, it, you know, is paving the way for, like, this, you know, total massive consolidation of our media industry is already consolidated. So how are we going to have, for me, the question for me, and I'll stop here, is, like, how are we going to have it? Dem- for me, I fight for media policy issues because I, I, uh, because it's a racial justice issue, right? And so, how are we going to have a? Uh, how can a, a a multiracial? It's a multiracial democracy. Can it be fully realized? And one way we need to make sure that happens is that we we need a media narratives that do not dehumanize people, you know, and so. This, so this is the goal. So this is the goal. So look, can we have equity in ownership of the infrastructure? And I'm not just talking about TV stations. I'm talking about broadband networks. I'm talking about cable, cable networks, um, all the different platforms that exist, you know? And so can we have policy that also like provide the community greater control and to be able to hold their broadcasters or their, their media infrastructure, whoever the media company is in the infrastructure accountable? How can we have more community control of the infrastructure? So, these are just like things you can think about, right? The the lo- like, what would it look like if we won, right? If we win this, right? How do you get there? Is the hard part? <laughs> it's the policy part. So I'll stop there. No, no. I mean that's awesome. And you know, folks watching, if you have questions, comments, you know, please throw them in the chat or in, in the Q and A. I mean, I, again, I think you know the challenge, and 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 again, why one of the reasons I'm so excited to have you in today's conversation is is I think what what we're all collectively struggling with is like on the music side. So as I said before, we've been having these very hard and very deep conversations about, again, some of the racial justice issues, some of the equity issues, some of the economic issues, I mean, all that stuff. And and the notion that in many ways, I I don't want to, you know, the music community and industry is extremely complicated. And and so I'm not trying to paint with a broad brush, but in, in many cases, it's been a, you know, it's, it's been built on, um, you know, cultural appropriation, exploitation, and we all know that, right? And, and so, so you've got one thread of like, okay, well, how do we understand that? And how do we think about that? And how do we think about, you know, the complexity of communities like New Orleans and, and, and others, you know, with these unbelievably rich traditions that where do they fit into the overall sort of economic schemes and, 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 and the economic life and, and the sustainability for artists? You've got all that stuff here. And then, you know, a lot of, again, of, 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 of the implications of what you're talking about, you know, again, gets into then like, okay, how do we not feel like a music version of climate grief, right? How do we not just shut down because it's too overwhelming, right? How do we boil it into, you know, something that we can take action on? And I would suggest there are, are kind of three pieces that are sort of underlying, you know, Joe, what you were kind of walking people through you know, certainly it feels like, and this may be totally performative, but it feels like there's a lot of efforts now for big banks to put more capital behind black owned businesses and innovation, right? I mean, there was a $30 billion announcement this week or blah, blah, blah. I don't even know what that was. Well, if we're thinking about, you know, BIPOC built and owned and conceived of and oriented, you know, sort of platforms for art and communication and culture, do they have any chance of actually reaching audiences and, and succeeding in the marketplace if we don't have net neutrality? Right. I mean, like, you know, so are they going to have to negotiate with AT&T and Verizon to get carriage or are they actually going to have the ability to sort of build out these structures and innovate? And, you know, 10 years from now, we'll be seeing this whole new generation of stuff um, on the commercial media side. To your point, you said it really well, like we've seen more and more consolidation. It's, it's just it's, it's been run away for the last 30 years. Um, it is what it is. You know, at this point, you know, we can try to roll it back and we can try to address it. And there are a lot of things we can and should be doing. That doesn't mean we don't fight it, but it's that one's sort of, you know, challenging to navigate, especially from a standpoint of like commercial radio. Um, but do these become opportunities in music context to fundamentally reconceive what is the role of non-commercial radio, right? We've seen how non-commercial radio has taken, you know, up the mantle of being the culture bearers and of doing, you know, having their local connections and of, of, of really doing what radio historically did in music. 
they've organically stepped up. They're building their own power through networks and through, through not programming networks, but through collaborative networks and leadership networks and like trying to think about how do we, how do these stations learn from each other and mentor each other? You know, the next 10 years can and will be and should be a really interesting conversation about how do we reconceive public media and how do we understand market failure, you know, as it relates to, to the music community. And how do we look at stations like KEXP uh, in Seattle, which we you know love and hold up as like you know one of the beacons you know for for music and, and for culture and community, and look at what they did this summer with you know taking aggressive measures to look internally and say what can we do to be an anti-racist organization? We're not doing enough, you know. So there's a lot of interesting things there that again don't have to feel like we're solving everything, um, which again is kind of unsolvable and exhausting. But it can be like okay, where are the places that we can plug in depending on what or our passion is and or our needs are. Um, Alicia, I'm sorry, I've been talking way too much today. I, you guys are lucky you missed the first segment. That got really dumb. But um, I'd love to hear some ideas about like your process moving forward, how people can intersect with that. Like what, what are you anticipating is gonna be, um, you know, kind of the response to this? Yeah, you know, that piece of, of overwhelm um, and, and climate disaster is so real. Uh, yeah. And so what I, one of the things I'm actually really excited about with this work is that, that that's been kind of our, we, we hold that and acknowledge that. And so that's why um, we know that there are people who have been for years fighting for reparations on different fronts and in different battles. Um, and so we knew it, it was not necessarily our work to be, to take on that whole mantle and just transform it or shift it or um, so, which is why we came down to media reparations because that, that even feels a, a little bit, for us at least right now, a little bit more uh, malleable and, and tangible. Um, and then within that, we're breaking it down to think about what does reparation and re reparative culture look like at a cultural level, an organizational uh, business level, um, a philanthropic level, and a governmental level. Um, because we also know that not everybody fights or feels comfortable um, being in all of those spaces. There are people who are a lot more accustomed and a lot more skilled at shifting um, cultures and practices within organizations and institutions. Um, and, we, and so those folks, there's no reason to say, okay, well now go do policy. Um, and, and for the, the folks who have been doing policy work and are steeped in that space, there's also no reason to say, we'll go and do some organizational change organizing. Um, so we really want to hold that people have skill sets and expertises and knowledges in each of those different spaces. Um, and so from there, I think right now, um, the, the way that we're holding this work is that we are we're asking folks to kind of engage with the material um, and, and, and pause, right? So like, it's a one read the essay, yes, share it, amplify it, all of those things. Um, and then reflect. So actually, in the, within the next few weeks, we're going to be releasing a reflection guide, um, to, to really sit in that space of reflection and discussion. Um, and we're going to be hosting events that have to do with reflection and have to do with what do we grieve and what do we leave behind? Um, Tonight, we're having a launch party. Um, so we just released the essay on Tuesday. And so this week, it's about engaging with the material, amplifying, and celebrating. Um, so we have a, a Black DJ from, uh, from North Carolina, from Durham, who's going to be curating sound. Um, we have a poet from Arizona, from Phoenix, who's going to be performing. Um, we have some folks who have been doing media policy work for a while, um, who are going to be speaking, Brandy Collins, Dexter, and Manolia Charlatan, and um, who are going to be there with us. And so it's a, it's a moment for us to celebrate. Um, and so from the celebration, then we're going to be asking folks after the kind of engaging with the, the material and reflecting and discussing, that's when we're going to start the dreaming process. Um, we're not jumping immediately into creating a policy platform. Um, so we're going to be partnering with different organizations and individuals and communities to host dream salons and visioning sessions so that we can be really aligned in our, our naming of a collective vision. That way, anything we build underneath that is in alignment as well. Um, because we, if we don't have the vision and we're not on similar pages there, then the pathways we create are going to take us all which ways. Um, 
So that's why we're using that process. And to make it, like you said, piece by piece. That's how, you know, you eat a large pizza bite by bite. Um, <laughs> so that's, that's what we're doing as well. If I just can awesome. add real quick, and I, I know Please, yeah. I, you know, I just wanted to jump, um, build on what Alicia was saying and what you were saying. So, like, the reason we call it 2070 is because we, 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 we there was a commission on race in Chicago in, in 1922. Then we had the current commission in the late 60s. And we have the racial uprisings happening now, including in newsrooms and art museums and stuff like that happening. And so the idea is it takes, it takes, it takes time. But, it, uh, you know, as Alicia is saying, is we, is we have... If we continue to build the community, have a vision of what, uh, what what is what the world ought to be like, what it should be like, and dream what the world should be, we have a path of what we know where we're going toward. Yeah. I think too often in policy is about the intermediate. It's always been left at the intermediate. We have to fight this battle now, without a larger vision of like what does a transformative media system look like. So. The other side has an idea of transformation. How do you want a transformation for, for, for evil, basically, for, for, you know, for terrible use? We, we you know, but we're always, because we're, we're smaller, and, you know, like the, the, the number of us who work in this field, uh, it's about the next battle and we're so busy fo focusing on winning, preventing bad things from happening off, often. And so this is, an, uh, is, we have a collective vision. Uh, uh, we know the path we need, we have a better sense of the path we need to take and then it can inform the kind of, on the policy side, the kind of fights we need to engage in, how we engage them. So that's part of like um, the, uh, what we're, we're trying to do right now. I think that's so smart. And um, just congratulations on, on doing the work and, you know, the ability to take that long view and to honor the long view and, you know, to, you know, understand. I mean, so, certainly something that we see um, so much in, in our work in the music side is just, the fact that nobody has all the answers, there's no five point plan. But if you create the spaces like we try to do here in, in, in our Friday program to just say people with different perspectives and come together, we can cobble some things and, and, and we can kind of move through organically to figure out what these better structures can look like and how do we actually make them happen. Um, so again, a huge shout out to the, um, to the essay. And I, I think on the essay, you've got contact information, right? So if people are interested in, in, in being part of the process and tagging in and potentially hosting events or just being part of the, what, what you're doing as you're, you're kind of building this out this year. Um, and we um, look forward to having you back. You know, I, I, I don't know if we're, how long we're going to do the show, so we won't have you back next week, but you know, um, we, we'd certainly look forward to kind of keeping up with what you're doing and, and, and helping plug into it in a way that's helpful and, and uh, you know, creating that amplification. So, Joe and Alicia, thank you so much for, for joining us today. Thank Thanks for your great work. And um, to all of you, again, who have spent a bunch of your Friday with us, we appreciate it. Um, the next three weeks, we're going to be getting back on the road in terms of our virtual city check-in um, conversations. Next week, we're going to be uh, in Portland. Uh, following week, the 23rd, we're going to be checking in with our friends in Denver, talking about the Denver and Colorado music community. And then the 30th, uh, we are going to be in New Orleans, and we have been promised Halloween costumes for October 30th. So look forward to that. Um, as always, thank you to Alex Stolden for doing a great job producing this. If you thought the show was fun and useful and interesting, find the YouTube link, send it to your friends uh, when the archive goes live early next week. And as always, again, um, questions, suggestions, compliments, concerns, um, anything, uh, hit us up at musicpolicyforum at gmail.org. Thanks again. Have a great rest of your Friday. We'll see you next week. Bye now.